ever wonder if Shakespeare, I mean, the guy who gave us Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, all that, if he was, well, someone else. Hmm, intriguing. Today's deep dive, we're going deep into Shakespeare authorship theories. I guess. Specifically, this YouTuber, goes by Bastian Conrad, claims Christopher Marlowe, another playwright from back then, actually wrote a couple of Shakespeare's most famous works. Interesting. Dr. Faustus and Hamlet. Okay, so we're talking about the theory that Marlowe faked his death and then wrote under the name Shakespeare. That's exactly what we're diving into. Wow, that's a bold claim. It is a bold claim, which is why we're here. We're diving deep into this. This theory by Bastian Conrad, it uses those plays, Dr. Faustus and Hamlet, almost like puzzle pieces, right. each one supposedly showing a hidden part of Marlowe's life. What's fascinating here is how this theory, presented by Bastian Conrad, uses those plays as puzzle pieces, each one supposedly reflecting a hidden chapter in Marlowe's life. So to understand it, we kind of need to look at the historical context here. So Marlowe, he was no stranger to controversy. His plays often pushed the boundaries, you know, of what was considered acceptable back then. Right. And his personal life, well, let's just say it was marked by accusations of, get this, atheism and treason. Oh, wow. He was not messing around. So kind of a rebel of the theater scene back then. Exactly. A true rebel. But and that's where this whole fake death idea comes into play. Bastian Conrad suggests that Marlowe, facing, you know, potential persecution for his beliefs, he decided to disappear. I see. Disappear and start fresh. Exactly. And continue his writing career, but under a brand new identity, William Shakespeare. Okay. I'm intrigued. I'll give you that. But I got to say, color me skeptical. What evidence does Bastian Conrad actually offer to back this up? We're talking about a pretty huge claim here. Right. Right. And it's a fair question. Their argument really hinges on this textual analysis of Dr. Faustus and Hamlet. They believe these plays are actually kind of disguised autobiographies, each one reflecting a different stage of Marlowe's supposed secret life. Okay, let's take a look. Let's start with Dr. Faustus. How does this connect to Marlowe? Okay, so Bastian Conrad focuses specifically on the 1616 version of Dr. Faustus. It's called the B-Text, and it has these additions that aren't in the earlier versions. And get this, 1616, that's the same year Shakespeare of Stratford died. Coincidence. Bastian Conrad doesn't think so. You're saying they think Marlowe used those additions to slip in clues about his real identity after Shakespeare died? Kind of like a confession from beyond the grave almost. Precisely. Like, for example, there's a line where Faustus, he's talking about having a false head, yeah. which Bastian Conrad interprets as, you know, a direct reference to Marlowe taking on this new identity as Shakespeare. Interesting point. But couldn't that just be, you know, a figure of speech, like just within the context of the play itself? Of course. Of course, that's the whole thing with textual analysis, right? It can be pretty open to interpretation. But Baskin Conrad, they've got other examples. Like, there's this line where Faustus says he's been limited for 24 years. And they interpret that as a coded message. Oh, okay. A coded message about what? About how long Marlowe supposedly lived with this assumed identity. 24 years. That would roughly line up with the timeline of Shakespeare's career. But again, feels like we're relying on a very specific interpretation here. Is there anything else in Dr. Faustus that Bastian Conrad points to? They also find parallels between the themes of the play and what they believe was happening in Marlowe's own life. Okay, how so? Well, in the play, Faustus makes a deal with the devil, right, for knowledge and power. But in the end, he faces damnation. Right, classic Faustian Morgan. Exactly. And Bastian Conrad argues that this whole thing, it mirrors Marlowe's supposed regret for faking his death, for living this lie, you know. So the play becomes a kind of confession, but disguised as fiction. Precisely. And this whole idea of a hidden life, of dealing with a secret identity, Bastian Conrad sees it reflected even more strongly in Hamlet. Okay, let's talk Hamlet. How does this play supposedly fit into Marlowe's story? So Bastian Conrad argues that Hamlet reflects a much later stage in Marlowe's supposed a secret life. They point to Hamlet's, you know, melancholy, his isolation, the uncertainty he feels, and say it mirrors the psychological toll of living under an assumed identity. That's a pretty interesting parallel. I mean, Hamlet's to be or not to be speech, you could definitely interpret that as a meditation on the burdens of living a double life. Right. And get this, Bastian Conrad even ties this idea to a specific literary technique that they claim Marlowe used called the inner voice technique. Inner voice technique. Okay, that sounds intriguing, but I'm not familiar with that. What is that exactly? So basically, it's when a playwright uses a character's dialogue, often in a soliloquy or an aside, 
to really express their own personal thoughts, their own feelings. Ah, so it's like a sneaky way for the playwright to kind of insert themselves into the play without actually breaking the fourth wall. Exactly. And Bastian Conrad believes that Marlowe uses this inner voice technique a ton in Hamlet. They even suggest characters like, you know, the ghost could actually be representing different sides of Marlowe's own mind. So when Hamlet's father's ghost shows up and demands revenge, Bastian Conrad is saying that's actually Marlowe speaking through the ghost expressing his own feelings. You got it. Their argument is that Marlowe, unable to openly talk about his real experiences or his true feelings, he used these characters as a way to express himself, you know, to grapple with his own inner struggles. That's a pretty bold claim. It seems like we need to really dive into some specific examples from Hamlet to understand how this theory works. Absolutely. And Bash and Conrad, they give plenty of examples, especially looking at the differences between those early versions of Hamlet, the quartos, to really make their case. Okay. Before we get too deep into the weeds of Hamlet, let's back up for a second. So Bastian Conrad is seeing these thematic stylistic connections between the plays and the supposed secret life of Marlowe's. But do they offer any hard evidence, any historical links to back this idea up? Well, they do point to one interesting detail. The recurring setting of Wittenberg University in both Dr. Faustus and Hamlet. Wittenberg University, I'll be honest, that connection completely slipped my mind. It seems like a small detail, I know, but Bastian Conrad thinks it's significant. See, Wittenberg back then, during the Renaissance, it was this renowned center of learning, known for its association with Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation, all that. Okay, I see the connection now, but how does that link to Marlowe? Well, think about it. Marlowe is a pretty controversial figure himself, right? Accused of atheism, of holding radical beliefs, that kind of thing. Yeah. So Bastian Conrad suggests that Wittenberg, with this whole atmosphere of intellectual freedom and religious questioning, it might have held a special meaning for Marlowe. Almost like a hidden message, a nod to his own journey. Exactly, like a little Easter egg for those in the know. But then again, Wittenberg was a very famous university. Couldn't it just be a coincidence or just a reflection of what was popular in theater at the time? It's definitely possible. It seems like this theory requires a bit of a leap of faith, right? connecting these dots, interpreting them in a very specific way. But I have a feeling Bastian Conrad isn't done yet. Oh, not even close. They dive even deeper, looking at those textual revisions, especially with Hamlet. Oh boy, textual revisions? This should be good. Textual revisions. I gotta say, the idea of someone using different versions of a play to hide secret messages kind of sounds like, you know, one of those Da Vinci Code things. Yeah, it's got that whole conspiracy thriller vibe to it, doesn't it? It's does. But you gotta remember, back in Elizabethan England, plays, they weren't always printed, you know, like in their complete form or with perfect accuracy. Right, right. Different versions will be floating around, some based on memory, others cobbled together from like actors' parts. Oh, wow. So like a big game of literary telephone, almost. Exactly. Like who knows what ended up where? And Bastian Conrad, they argue that Marlowe, you know, being the supposed mastermind he was, he used these different versions, these quartos, to his advantage. Okay. They point specifically to the first quarto of Hamlet, the Q1. It's shorter, and some people think it might have even been pirated. Hold on, hold on, Q1. You're going to have to break this down for those of us who, you know, didn't spend all our time studying Elizabethan drama. Of course, of course. (laughs) So a quarto, it's basically just how a book was printed back then, folded twice to make four leaves. Think of it like different editions of the same book. Okay. Now Q1, this first quarto, it's a little, shall we say, rough around the edges, Mm -hmm. possibly even put together from memory by actors who are in the play. Wow, that's wild. So trying to like remember a whole movie after seeing it only once? Yeah, kind of like that. Now compare that to Q2, the second quarto. It's longer, generally considered to be the more uh, authoritative version. Yeah. And... Bastian Conrad, they say the differences between these versions, especially in those key scenes like Hamlet's to be or not to be speech, they're really revealing. Okay, okay, you've got my attention. What's so revealing about them? So they argue that Q1, being potentially closer to that original performance, it might actually have more of Marlowe's real voice in it, his true intentions. Okay. And then according to their theory, with Q2, Marlowe intentionally made the language a lot more complicated added layers to kind of hide his real identity even more. So covering his tracks, making it harder to see those autobiographical elements that Bastian Conrad is talking about. Exactly. They argue that Marlowe, he knew that eventually people would compare these versions, like scholars and theater goers, you know, down the line. And he used that to his advantage. 
created a smoke screen. Okay, I have to admit, that's pretty clever. If it's true, of course. But it does still feel like we're working with a lot of speculation, a lot of what-ifs. Is there any actual evidence from back then, any accounts from Marlowe's time that suggest people thought he was behind Shakespeare's work? Well, that's where things get even more interesting. Bastian Conrad brings up the writings of Gabriel Harvey. Gabriel Harvey, okay. Remind me, who was that again? He was a scholar, a writer, and he knew both Marlowe and Shakespeare. Okay. Now, Harvey, he was known for, let's just say, his sharp wit. Okay. He had some pretty strong opinions, especially about Marlowe's work and uh, his character. Oh, this is getting good. Did he actually come out and say, like, hey, I think the Shakespeare guy is actually Marlowe in disguise? Not quite that directly. But there's this one passage in Harvey's writings where he's, you know, reflecting on Marlowe's talent, but then he goes on to criticize him. Oh, okay, so a little backhanded compliment. Exactly. He even calls Marlowe, get this, irreligious. Oh, he did not hold back. Right. And it's this passage that Bastian Conrad really latches onto. Okay. So in Harvey's essay, it's called A New Letter of Notable Contents, he writes. And I'm paraphrasing here a bit. But he says something like, May they not, sir, cease to wonder how much evil Marlowe can teach a prince to be or not to be religious. Hold on. To be or not to be, that's Hamlet. Is Batch and Conrad saying that Harvey's making a hidden reference to Hamlet? That only someone like Marlowe could have written such a morally ambiguous character? Exactly. Now, did Harvey actually intend for that to be some kind of secret message? Who knows? We are talking about interpreting texts from, like, over 400 years ago. But it does make you think, doesn't it? It really does. So we've got these like tantalizing clues, these little threads maybe connecting Marlowe to Shakespeare's plays. But is it enough to completely rewrite history? Has Bastian Conrad really uncovered this massive conspiracy? That's the million dollar question, right? And to answer that, I think we need to zoom out a little. Look at the bigger picture here, the historical context. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are the limits of just relying on textual analysis? Okay, big picture time. We've got this really interesting theory these clues in Dr. Faustus and Hamlet. But realistically, how likely is it that Marlowe, a known playwright, could vanish, become this other guy, and, well, no one noticed? It's the question at the heart of this whole debate, and got to be fair to the Shakespeare scholars out there, there's a ton of stuff pointing to Shakespeare actually being, well, Shakespeare. We're talking playbills, documents, people who knew the guy, right? Exactly. He wasn't just some, like, phantom of the theater. Right. And that's where this theory as fun as it is, kind of hits a wall. It's asking us to, like, jump on board with a lot of maybes without giving us that slam dunk proof. No secret diaries from Marlowe. No one's saying, hey, I saw him writing Hamlet. Not that we found. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Bastian Conrad has a good eye, finds these cool links, but proving it, that's tough. So have we spent all this time on a big old literary hoax? Not really. Even if Marlowe wasn't Shakespeare, we got something valuable here. A new way of looking at things. It reminds us history can be messy, especially literary history. So like more than one draft. Totally. Multiple versions, different interpretations. It's not always cut and dry. It's like Bastian Conrad gave us special glasses. Maybe we don't see everything, but we're seeing the plays the whole time period differently. Exactly. And that's what's great about these theories. They make us think harder, question what we assume, realize there's always more to find, even in stuff we thought we knew backwards and forwards. Makes you wonder... What other secrets are hidden in plain sight, just waiting for someone to piece them together? Right. Absolutely. Maybe Marlowe wasn't Shakespeare. But this opens up a whole new path. What other writers used fake names? What other famous works have hidden stories? No, that's both exciting and a little creepy, right? Like, the whole history of literature could be turned upside down. And in a way, isn't that a good thing? Keeps things interesting, keeps us asking questions, not just assuming. That's what a real learner does, you know, always up for a new angle, a good mystery. Well said. So to everyone listening, next time you pick up a classic, don't just believe the name on the cover. Poke around a little, get curious. Who knows what you'll find? Until next time, happy reading, everyone.